I don't know if I would ever describe Lost in Translation as fun. Yes. I, I, it was Are you fun thinking for me. of the same movie? Yeah, I just remember him. He's a little down. He's doing the whiskey ads, but he's I remember a him little down going out in the streets of Tokyo. You know, he's doing karaoke. He's learning to love life again. Maybe I need to watch it again. Yeah. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down the Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked out. Welcome back to Chat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question were the movies we love when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash Heaven and Hell Guggenheim. Hi, y'all. And Big D Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatthemovies.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Shat on TV. We review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Lovecraft Country, Game of Thrones, True Detective, and Watchmen. Find all the information and past episodes at ShadowTV.com. Finally, if you'd like to hang out with us live all week long, follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, ShadowTheMovies.com slash Twitch, where we play video games, host watch parties, and recently had our Hot Sauce Challenge with Hot Sauce Steve, which you can check out on YouTube and Twitch. All that being said, Big D, what movie are you reviewing today? So, Gene, a lot of times people accuse us of only either doing popular movies or sometimes they feel they're too abstract movies. We can't make people always happy. So this week we decided for our listener, Paul D., that we were going to prove that we were different. We were quirky. We were eccentric. We're going to forget about our schoolwork. We're going to focus on our extracurriculars. And we're going to go back to private school in Houston with Ash. And we're going to review the 1998 coming-of-age comedy, Rushmore. And Paul, our commissioner, wrote in and said, Hey, guys, ever since my sister introduced me to your podcast, one of the very few I listen to regularly, I have enjoyed the nostalgia and oftentimes pure joy of reliving the movies of pivotal times in my life. Being younger than Big D and older than Gene and Roger, I find myself connecting to, while not always agreeing with the reviews of some of my favorite movies. I decided to commission a movie that is important to the history of my relationship to my wife. When we were still good friends, Rushmore provided countless hours of enjoyment and was emblematic of the shared love for movies that brought us closer together. So I hope Big D can table his hatred of Bill Murray and enjoy the genius of Wes Anderson in its rawest form. Keep up the good work, Paul D. Big D, I thought you hated Wes Anderson and liked Bill Murray. No, I, I I hate Wes Anderson, but I think that we were just commenting on Bill Murray being always Bill Murray. I like Bill Murray, but Bill Murray is Bill Murray. Well, he's not in this. Nope, definitely not. Well, Rushmore is a 1998 coming-of-age comedy directed by Wes Anderson about an eccentric teenager named mm-hmm. Max Fisher, played by Jason Schwartzman, in his film debut. His friendship with rich industrialist Herman Bloom, played by Bill Murray, and their love for elementary school teacher Rosemary Cross, played by Olivia Williams. The film was co-written by Wes Anderson and Owen Wilson. Rushmore's soundtrack features several songs by bands associated with the British invasion of the 60s, and filming began in November 1997 around Houston, Texas. The film helped launch the careers of Anderson and Schwartzman while establishing a second career for Bill Murray as a respected actor in independent cinema. At the 1999 Independent Spirit Awards, Anderson won Best Director and Murray won Best Supporting Male. Murray also earned a nomination for the Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actor in a Motion Picture. Starting from Rushmore, Murray has been Anderson's collaborator in every subsequent film of the director. While the box office results were modest, the film had positive reception among film critics. So, Ash, big deal. We always ask what your memories are of the movie we're covering. I first saw Rushmore on DVD after the King Bee got me hooked on Bottle Rocket, and I'd never seen anything like either of these movies. I think we watched both in the same winter, and Wes Anderson was completely fresh at the time. If we try to think back before we knew all the tricks, before we knew all the hallmarks of a Wes Anderson movie, we were seeing this stuff, and it was just 
absolutely out of left field. At the time, like Bill Murray was that guy from Ghostbusters and Jason Schwartzman didn't look like any actor I'd ever seen before. It's this kid with this huge nose and these <laughs> plastic frames. And that just wasn't cool at the time, but it was like instantly cool to all of us. It was a very exciting time to be watching movies. Yeah, I don't really remember the first time that I saw this because I feel like kind of Wes Anderson films and the whole world that he's created, it's always been a part of my life. And it's always been, for some reason, this world I never knew I wanted to live in, but deeply am, upon seeing like his first film, wanted to live exactly in the world he was creating. Uh, Bottle Rocket, of course, was my very first Wes Anderson that I saw. And it was quickly followed by this, and the Royal Tenenbaums. And I just was in love with the way that he told stories. And I was in love with the comedy and the type of act of this geeky kid that was actually really kind of swaggy and badass. And I don't know. I mean, Wes Anderson, I have a love affair with him. Life Aquatic changed my life. The Darjeeling Limited is a, one of the few films that can make me cry. I love him. I love all of his films. And I am pretty stoked to, to review this one tonight. So I've never been able to sit through an entire Wes Anderson film before <laughs> this review, ever. I find him pretentious. I find his stories about like wealthy, eccentric characters and their they're, they're families that are dysfunctional. I, I just never interested me. I didn't. He seemed to be trying to be cool. It seemed forced. His scripts, all the one liners were droll. They would land. Everything was sarcastic or it was just some kind of sadness. His final scenes were always a slow mo, dramatic. He obviously used these 60s songs. He loved them. He put them in every film. The sets were beautiful. I got to tell you, it, it's great if this was like a music video. But over the length of a film and just repeating the same set designs, daddy issues, tons of white people problems, it, it just never interested me. So he might have a diverse cast. I, I don't, he might have some some multicultural problems, but it just seems like everyone is like royalty. Everyone is wealthy. Every, it seems like Knives Out if it was going to be this weird fringe movie. I was say somewhere out there, Kumar Palana is like rolling in his grave. Like, what, I was know. I not Indian enough for you, Big D? <laughs> Let's hit that trailer. These are the names that define our world. The artists who shaped our minds. The rebels who challenged our views. But of all these legends, there is one that stands above all others. I'm sorry, did someone say my name? <laughs> What's the secret, Max? The secret? I think you just gotta find something you love to do and then do it for the rest of your life. For me, it's going to Rushmore. Sharp little guy. He's one of the worst students we've got. We're putting you on what we call sudden death academic probation. Could I see some documentation on that, please? Did you invite that kid to your party? Max Fisher. Come on, Dad, there's gonna be girls there. I'd rather die. Pull your head out of your... Maybe I'm spending too much of my time starting up clubs and putting on plays. It's time, homie. Kiss me, little one. I should probably be trying harder to score chicks. I like your hat. You're a teacher here, aren't you? Oh, I'm so glad you could come. I want you to meet a friend of mine, Peter Flynn, Max Fisher. Hi. Who's this guy? Has it ever crossed your mind that you're far too young for me? I like your nurse's uniform, guy. These are OR scrubs. Oh, are they? I don't know what you see in her. I, I don't think she's right for you. What's that supposed to be? Hello, Herman. How are you, Rosemary? I know about you and the teacher. Does Max know? He's about five foot three, 112 pounds, glasses. You know, you and Herman deserve each other. You're both little children. War does funny things to men. But you'll find a pair of safety glasses and some earplugs underneath your seats. Please feel free to use them. What do you think of Max's latest opus? It's good. But let's hope it's got a happy ending. Rushmore. Thank you very much. Max Fisher 
is a scholarship student at Rushmore Academy, a private school in Houston. Although he participates extensively in extracurricular activities, Max struggles academically. The school's headmaster, Dr. Guggenheim, played by Brian Cox, warns Max that if he continues to struggle with his grades, he will be expelled. At a school assembly, Max meets Herman Bloom, played by Bill Murray, a businessman who despises his family. Herman comes to like Max, and the two become good friends. Max is impressed by Herman's success, while Herman is interested in Max's confident persona. So as this movie opens up, Big D, those telltale things that make you cringe and make me swoon, you immediately know this is a Wes Anderson film. There's that classy music. There's these plush colors, just like an explosion of rich greens and maroons, the keying in on exactly the human textures and details of life that have been erased since the 80s. That's how I like identify a Wes Anderson movie, right? All the shit that we decided to fucking sanitize when we made all the walls white and all the surfaces gray and and chrome and bleached everything out in our houses. Wes Anderson says no to all that. That's the visual feel that we get. And I felt like watching Rushmore was like watching portraits come to life. Everything is so beautifully framed. And I know Big D are likely to dismiss it as being like indulgent, but it serves a purpose because when you see Max shift over from Rushmore to like a public school, it's a pulling away from that fantasy world. And everything's it's so jarring. Everything is like in these fluorescents and, and, and very plain. All the whimsy and nostalgia and color is gone and it just becomes this bleak modern classroom. And I think that without that specific visual treatment that he gives all of his movies, you can't buy in fully to that fantasy of what they are. Yeah, I think what's interesting about this is this movie was filmed here in in Houston. And we when we first moved to the city, we lived in a part of the city called River Oaks. And that is where both Rushmore and the um, school that is the stand in for Grover Cleveland, they're very close to there. So Grover Cleveland, the stand in for it is Lamar High School. And Lamar High School is actually one of the best public schools in the city. Uh, it's a fantastic school. It's it's older. The building is definitely older. It's not that new kind of fancy look that a lot of brand new schools have. But right down the street is St. John's School, which is the stand-in for Rushmore, which is actually where Wes Anderson went himself. That was his alma mater. And it's the stand-in there. And what I find really funny about this is that it's supposed to look like Grover Cleveland is in like this, you know, lower socioeconomic area, but Lamar is in one of the wealthiest parts of the city. And if you walk maybe three blocks from Lamar, you get into the part of Houston that has the beyond, you know, five, six million dollar homes, like the one that his teacher is staying in where they go and knock on it. That's what all the houses in River Oaks look like. So there's just this irony of seeing it. And there's like a tour here that will take you through all the spots where Rushmore, it's a Rushmore tour. And then there's a Reality Bites tour. And I promise you there are much different parts of town because Reality Bites is in Montrose, which is not nearly as fancy as River Oaks. So I'll admit, I came into this, my, my defenses were up. My Wes Anderson, I was I was ready to hate. I was ready to just like jump on stuff. And I found early on this whimsical music that he uses. The 60s stuff is great, but he plays like almost comically like, like cartoonish, like fair music. It was overly quirky. It was annoying. And I just felt, I'm like, Wes, I, I know. You're trying to be different. You. This was early on. You're going to break out. You want to show people, I'm not traditional Hollywood. I'm offbeat. I'm the Beck of directors. It just felt heavy handed. And um, the hairs on my neck were standing up. I don't know, though. Like, is there any moment in cinema that is more harrowing to a song than in Royal Tenenbaums when he slits his wrist to Needle in the Hay by Elliot Smith or ending the Darjeeling Limited with Champs-Élysées, like that song? Like, I mean, he... He does such this amazing job of melding like the world of the old music with things that are set in present day, which makes them almost anachronistic and of themselves. Like they're just completely out of time and don't exist within any time. So you could watch it in 99, you could watch it in 2021, you could watch it in 1979, and it would feel like it made sense in any of those worlds. And Gene, to kind of build on what you're saying, I, we would be remiss. I mean, we've got an auteur here, right? Like to not say something about the way that he shoots his films. <laughs> 
And one of the reasons why, you know, Jean, you talk about how you feel so at home and I feel so at home in this world. Part of it is the way that Wes Anderson shoots. So he famously shoots in a composition where there's absolute symmetry at almost every single moment in his film. Every scene is framed to be absolutely symmetrical and the characters are kind of put in place over it. And oftentimes the character shot symmetrical as well. There's really beautiful moments in this with Max and Bloom existing in exactly the same frame and it's shot where they look like they're the same size. And it kind of gives us this, you know, this pleasing feeling of a world that while it's not ours, it kind of feels like it belongs to us. And Gene, you mentioned how everything feels like a portrait come to life. The way that he shoots, it makes everything look two-dimensional. And so as a result of that, everything looks like a photograph or a painting. And and it just, again, it's just so damn charming. I can totally feel that. And that's a positive. I, he always, in, even in this movie, there's the shot of the Bloom family paintings. When you're watching the movie, you can feel it. It's shot different. And that is, I think, a Wes Anderson. That's one of his strengths. It's beautifully shot. It lets the actors and the dialogue shine. That is great. But the characters, Max, he is unlikable. Nobody genuinely likes this kid. Nobody. Everyone just seems to tolerate him. Oh, it's Max. It's Max. Okay. His mother died of cancer. Every word out of this kid's mouth, it's a lie. And he's not fooling anybody. Everybody knows it. But that's the point. Max is that kid. So I, I'm okay with it. Thank God Herman comes into it, Bill Murray. And when they start their interactions, and he says, hey, uh, were you in the shit? And Herman <laughs> looks at him like, who the fuck are you? Yes, I was in the shit. I started to immediately buy in, and I got the characters. What? I, this kid's incredible. <laughs> like, I absolutely adore everything about him from that first scene where he gets up to answer the geometry question and he holds his cappuccino in his left hand the entire time while writing with chalk. I, I watched this with Tom because this is one of the few movies we review that Tom actually likes. And so we watched this together and we both were like, man, I hope Finn grows up to be somewhat like this. Like, he's a fucking cool kid. But that's his self-view. That's his fantasy view. Yeah. Max is an awful person. I agree with Big D. He's entertaining. Yes, but he's not likable. He only thinks about himself. This guy has no issue manipulating, posturing. Yeah. He only hangs out with sycophants, right? He's got he's got Dirk, who basically looks up to him. That's like the person who thinks he's cool. He, what does he do when he gets in trouble? Ah, oh, can we let this slide? You know, he's always trying to think of a way out. He's not likable. But he has that full journey throughout the movie, though. At the end, you still don't think he's likable when he comes clean. And he he's still that cool. He still is opening the kite society. He's got this ridiculous play. And I don't know. I just think he's a badass. You think at the end, he actually genuinely likes Margaret? No. No. She likes him and he likes that she likes him. That's it. I don't think so. I he think he's lies wanted- even at the very end. I thought maybe oh. he had grown up when he says, hey, I tried to develop this at Rushmore. Oh, was it the politics? No, somebody lost a finger in production. Right, that was funny. He is a liar, but he's funny. Yeah, I mean, I'll use the same argument for like Scott Pilgrim versus the world, right? Scott's a shitty dude, but you root for him. He's fun. But in real life, I'd be like, hey, he's a really bad guy. Like, He's not a good dude. Agree to disagree. <laughs> Upon reading a written message left in a library book, Max tracks down the book's previous borrower, Rosemary Cross, a widowed first grade teacher at Rushmore, and soon develops an obsession with her. He attempts to woo her by successfully petitioning to have the Latin curriculum kept at Rushmore and later acts hostile toward a friend Rosemary invited to one of Max's plays. Max then attempts to court Rosemary by building an aquarium next to the baseball field, but he's stopped by Dr. Guggenheim at the groundbreaking ceremony and expelled from Rushmore. For those of you where this movie's not your first Anderson, it's kind of interesting when you go back to watch it because the comedy in this is so much more straightforward and obvious than it is in his other films. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all, but I was surprised at how many like genuine jokes there are in this because one of the best parts, of course, is still when Luke will Wilson is there and he says, these are my OR scrubs. And Max says, oh, are they? <laughs> yes. You know, it's a fucking hilarious joke, but it's a legitimate 
joke. And that type of obvious comedy he would stop doing after this movie. You would still have funny parts of his films, you know, Stiller in his track suits, that amazing B team moment with William Willem Dafoe and Life Aquatic when he's upset because he thinks he's on the B team. You know, there's some hilarious parts where you would laugh out loud, but they aren't intended to be obvious. Like you were talking about Big D, they're much more subtle. They're much more droll and much more deadpan than than he would do in this. So in going back and trying to learn more about Wes Anderson, I kept hearing about Bottle Rocket and then subsequently learned that this was the first film where he was the director, writer, and executive producer. So he was kind of reined in. He was subdued. You could see what he'd become, but it was a plot that revolved around a blue collar kid his father. It wasn't this eccentric, dysfunctional, wealthy family, royalty. And and I found that to be something I could grab onto. I found it enjoyable. I'm going to give him another chance. I may have judged him by the few snippets I had seen, but going off of this, I see he's capable of much more. It's funny because I glommed onto the other side of it. I was like, wealthy industrialist who hates his family? Yes, please. Done. Uh, I watched Bill Murray <laughs> in this party scene. And yeah. as a kid, I watched the scene and all I see is like this old man who's throwing golf balls into a pool without even looking at the pool, smoking a cigarette and, and having a whiskey. And I'm like, man, we were having so much fun in this movie. This is so depressing. This man is so empty. He's so out of love with his life. Now (laughs) I am that guy. (laughs) Like now as an adult, if someone said, hey, listen, there's going to be a party. You have the option to just go sit by the side, throw fucking golf balls into the pool, smoke a cigarette, avoid the party, down a tumbler of whiskey, and then dive into silence and just hang out underwater in a cannonball position. That sounds fucking great. Like there is something so satisfying of reaching that point in life where you don't want anything beyond a good meal, a warm blanket and a drink. No, this is the goal. This is what everyone's life goal should be. (laughs) You become so successful that you don't give a fuck. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to act. You don't have to go to a birthday party and be like, hey, everyone, let's have cake. You can just sit there and smoke your cigarette and not give a shit and watch your wife flirt with some young kid. I love Bloom's disdain for his entire family. It was the first time I laughed throughout the entire movie. I know everybody says Wes Anderson's hilarious. I got a few chuckles. The disappointment that he says, I've never envisioned I would have these types of sons. And when his son is talking shit in the back of the car and he turns around, just slaps him. (laughs) It's great because as a parent, every fucking parent should should fear that they're going to have asshole kids. And this movie succeeds because of Bill Murray, I think. Not only is the fact that he's an established actor, there's a gravitas to him. So even Paul D thought I hated Bill Murray, and I don't hate Bill Murray. He's a great actor, but a lot of times he doesn't care. He just mails it in. Venkman is Bill Murray. Groundhog's Day, Phil, that is Bill Murray. Here, Bill Murray commits. He actually cares. You can see that Wes Anderson got him to buy into playing someone else playing something different. There's a part where he like jumps over this six foot chain link fence and he hits the ground. You know, there's no stunt double, you know, to get Bill Murray to do that, to buy into it and give an effort. This other than I think 2014 St. Vincent is one of my favorite Bill Murray efforts. You're going to have to watch the life aquatic with Steve Zizou then because that performance in that movie is light years beyond what he does in this. That entire film, there's an ending part, which I will not give away because you should see it on your own and then cry horrible, horrible sobbing tears because it is so beautiful that his performance breaks every part of you, every human part of you, it just <laughs> like destroys. And not only would this Bill Murray performance give us that, it would also give us Lost in Translation Bill Murray. I love Sofia Coppola. I love that film. And thank God for Rushmore because none of that would have followed without it. Lost in Translation is a glorified music video. It's such a disappointing Bill Murray movie. I was disgusted in the theater while watching it. I was like, what the fuck was that? I liked it. I remember enjoying it. The music mm-hmm. was great. It was fun. Again, it was different Murray. Fun? I don't know if I would ever describe Lost in Translation as fun. Yes. I, I, it was Are you fun thinking for me. of the same movie? 
Yeah, I just remember him. He's a little down. He's doing the whiskey ads, but he's I remember a him little down going out in the streets of Tokyo. You know, he's doing karaoke. He's learning to love life again. Maybe I need to watch it again. Yeah, I, f- I feel like you mixed up Lost in Translation and Mister Baseball and made like a <laughs> mashup of the two. He's got a great mustache, hitting a couple dingers. I gotta watch it. I liked it though. Well, Max enrolls at Grover Cleveland High School, a local public school. Bloom encourages Max to give up pursuing Rosemary, but eventually becomes attracted to her himself. Max's friend Dirk discovers a relationship between Rosemary and Bloom and informs Max as payback for rumor Max started about his mother. Max and Bloom go from being friends to mortal enemies, and they engage in back and forth acts of revenge. Max is eventually arrested for cutting the brake lines on Bloom's car. He attempts to get revenge on Rosemary by taking damaging photos of her and Bloom together, but learns from Guggenheim, Rosemary has already resigned. The movie has to work because of Max. If Max is off, if Jason Schwartzman had dropped the ball on the performance, it wouldn't have mattered how good Bill Murray is. This movie just would have never made any sense. And Jason Schwartzman is fantastic in this. And I love him. I think he's one of the most underrated actors out there, not just in his Wes Anderson films, but in everything else. Although he was great in Marie Antoinette, another Sofia Coppola film. And also within all the Wes Anderson universe, one of my favorite performances of his is in the short film Hoto Chevalier where he plays the character that he also plays in the Darjeeling Limited but it's the short with Natalie Portman he's just good and you can see from the get go how good he is going to be and what I love about Max is the confidence that he has most teenagers at 15 years old especially if they look like Max does does not have the confidence that he does and I would love if my kids were this confident one day or if they were this creative (laughs) and I would and more so than that, I think that what works too is that Schwartzman actually looks like a kid. He was what, 17, 18 when he was filming this. And I don't know if any of you out there have seen any of the coverage about the Dear Evan Hansen film and how horrible, how absolutely horrific Ben Platt looks as Evan Hansen. He looks like a 50-year-old man. <laughs> they tried to de-age him. He's got this weird curly, curly, froey thing going on. They put all this makeup on him. He looks terrible. He does not look like a teenager. And because of that, the whole movie doesn't work. But Schwartzman, he looks awkward. He looks gawky. You could buy that he'd still be wearing braces. But as a result of all that, he's still charming and you know that this kid one day is going to grow up and run a company and be a fucking rock star and more than anything i love that he isn't classically smart he's not sitting there you know getting 100s he's not valedictorian he's got this weird street smarts about him that i think is really fantastic max is dangerous max is psychotic he is unstable He is a pathological liar. He's burning the leaves at the school. He's showing up in the back of Bloom's car. He's stalking (laughs) Miss Cross in her classroom. He tries to force himself on her. I'm like, oh, shit. There's no doubt Ash and Jean are going to have a problem with this. He tells Bloom's wife about the affair. He threatens to stick a knife in Magnus's back and put a cap in his ass. Max, he, he cuts the brakes in Bloom's car. What if that kills his sons in the back or runs over somebody at Rushmore? He destroys multiple lives and not once does he care. Not once does he regret it. Lies to the end. He's crazy. No, I mean, it's all hyperbole. And that's what's so funny about it is the one-upmanship because Bloom is just like him. They're like two sides of the same coin. And that's kind of, we talked about like the symmetry of Wes Anderson. He's got a symmetry between two characters here. They're decades apart, but they're exactly, exactly the same. And there's a creativity and like an artistry to their to their tit for tat too. Like the the fucking best part about this whole like back and forth where they're fucking with each other's shit is when Bloom runs over his bike, but then goes and puts it back on the bike rack. He puts a lot of, you know, wraps the chain around it. It's fucking hilarious. But Big D, that's why you need the whimsical music. Yep. It lets you know that this isn't serious. It lets you know that it's just a joke. And Max, even when he like tries to force himself on Mrs. Cross, the way she puts him in his place. Shows you that he's just a 15-year-old kid doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. And come on, the bee scene. There's nothing fucking funnier than that <laughs> two being in that door and those bees <laughs> flying into that hotel room. Which, by the way, is Hotel Zaza here in Houston, one of the best places to like do like a little staycation. It's absolutely beautiful. I will give it to you. Like The character of Max is so unaware of social norms. When he calls Bloom's wife to that rooftop garage... 
and he's laid out a lunch and he asks her, do you want tuna fish and apple juice? He is just, he's a different type of cat. <laughs> the best is that she says, I'll take the tuna fish. <laughs> yes. I mean, that light alone. <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. The, and there's actually a pattern in the movie of people saying yes to things that you don't expect them to. When you get to the the you know the final scene with the kite and Dirk is flying the kite and he like offers the kite reel over to Max. 99% of movies, fuck, 999 out of a thousand movies, the guy's upset. He's not gonna take it. And they show you, oh, he's so upset he doesn't want to fly the kite. Why would he want to fly a kite some dumb kid is flying? No, he takes the fucking reel <laughs> and he flies it for a while. When Bill Murray uh, is standing on Rosemary's uh, doorstep and she just offers him a carrot. It's Bill Murray eating a carrot in a movie. Oh. You don't expect him to say yes. I love that about it. Mm-hmm. Well, Max eventually gives up and meets Bloom at his mother's grave. He explains that revenge no longer matters because even if he wins, Rosemary would still love Bloom. He becomes reclusive and begins to skip school to work at his father's barber shop. One day, Dirk reveals to Max that Dr. Guggenheim suffered a stroke and suggests that he visit him at a hospital, knowing Bloom will also be there. Max and a washed up Bloom meet and are courteous. Bloom tells Max that Rosemary broke up with him due to her continuing love for her dead husband. And Max eventually returns to school and begins to improve his grades. So we've been doing this long enough where I feel like we can see the strings in the movies. I mean, Big D, you and I just watched The Sure Thing. <laughs> yeah. And we could predict everything that was going to happen between John Cusack and Daphne Zuniga. Wes Anderson does this thing where he uses non sequiturs, but they completely fit this wildly fluid mood of the movie. I think one of our biggest complaints on the pod is when the movie can't choose a mood and we're lost, you know, where things don't quite match up exactly the right way. I mean, Ash, you mentioned that about kids. Here, they're non sequiturs. They're completely out of place, and yet they fit perfectly. One of my favorites is when we go from Miss Cross confronting Max in the classroom and crushing him beneath the weight of his sexual immaturity, right? Being like, how do you think this was going to go? Did you think we we're going to have sex? Do you think I was going to give you a hand job? Is that what you want? So we have this very dramatic, jaw-dropping moment. And then we go to the cemetery where Max is visiting his mother's grave and he tells Bloom that he planned to end their beef by having a giant tree fall on him. And they do the whole thing deadpan, yet none of it feels out of place. No, and what's so smart is that just when you think the joke is over, it goes to another level. So you've got Bill Murray standing there, and he's like, oh, I was going to have that tree fall on you. And so that's funny on its own. And then Mur Bill Murray takes it up a notch where he says, well, thank goodness, because that would have crushed me. And the way he delivers it is hilarious. And then Mac, Max walks away and Bill Murray goes up and breaks a branch off and the whole tree falls over and hits the ground. And so it's like this three part joke that is so smart and so subtle in the way that it builds up. It's kind of multi-layered. And the best part about it is it's absolutely earned. Like you said, Gene, a lot of times you just kind of jump from thing to thing and you don't earn that transition. Like these non sequiturs are earned because of the way that they're ingrained in the movie. Uh, anyone who doubts that I'm genuine on this podcast, this should prove to you that I am. I had no clue what a non sequitur was. So as you guys are talking about, it, I decided to Google it. And for those out there who don't know either, a non sequitur is a conclusion or statement that does not logically follow from the previous argument or statement. So we all could learn something on Shat the Movies, and I learned something today. Shat on vocab. <laughs> <laughs> vocabulary aside big d how did that scene sit with you like is that funny to you uh you get into the wes anderson kind of mood he lulls you into it to where you're not expecting anything and then he surprises you when we watched the sure thing we were logically thinking this is what's going to happen this is traditionally this is going to cut to the next scene wes anderson gets you to not expect anything and if he does anything well it's to expect the unexpected. And use 60s rock. Yeah. Well, Max takes his final shot at Rosemary by pretending to be injured in a car accident, but she discovers that Max's injuries are fake. He then decides to help Bloom and Rosemary reconcile, first by inviting her to another aquarium groundbreaking ceremony, but she does not show up. Max then invites both Rosemary and Bloom to attend his Vietnam War-themed play <laughs> at Grover Cleveland, and the two appear to reconcile. At the after-play party, Max reveals to Bloom and Rosemary that he and his classmate Margaret are dating. The film ends with Rosemary and Max sharing a dance. 
So I was really excited about the ensemble ending and I expected a little more from the final play. I remember this thing making me laugh my ass off like as a college kid. Yes, it's a silly parody of Vietnam movies and Max's little mind, but I felt like the play fell flat. It almost shied away from something meaningful and a glimmer of authenticity from this rather awful kid. I'm not saying that I needed like a moment where Max was like redeemed, but I thought that there was going to be some breakthrough, some sliver of truth in there that we were going to get something more than a yuck, yuck play. They built it up so much. I couldn't help but be a little disappointed by this scene. No, I completely disagree. The, <laughs> his plays, whether it was Serpico, that fucking made me buy it. Serpico was great. <laughs> the production value, it's great. He's got the miniature like helicopter in the background. The guy's got the flamethrower. He's fucking throwing it all out there. It is great. And the best line and the biggest laugh for me in the movie, it's the climax. And we have the character comes out to you that says, hey, simplify. We'll meet someday. And it cuts to bloom, and there's a tear coming down his eye. It's great. And then you get to the after party, man. The after party is fantastic. And you get like the coach and the other employees of the schools. He's like, I can't believe they let him uh, burn a campfire on stage. Yeah. Do you heard he tried to raise piranha? And they get to the last guy, and he goes, It's the best play I've ever seen. <laughs> I fucking loved it by the end. Which is why I think that your comments earlier about how this is like his persona, this is how he sees himself. I think that's what Anderson shows us at the end is that that's what's actually still inside of him without the guise of Rushmore around him, that he's just this really precocious, really eccentric, really brilliant kid. And I, I personally think the best part of that scene is when everything starts to explode and then the whole audience puts on those safety goggles <laughs> and they put on yes. their headphones. I mean, it's absolutely yeah. hilarious. And I agree. The after party is great, but the after party gives us the first of what would become an absolute just staple of Wes Anderson cinema, which is the slow motion, these slow motion endings. And we have joked about the ridiculousness of slow motion in countless films. Uh, the one that stands out the most to me will forever be Emilio Estevez bouncing yeah. in that trunk onto the ground <laughs> and then coming out of it all four foot 11 of him and then trying to shoot everybody around him. It is stupid. But there is something about the way Wes Anderson does it that works. And so I started reading some things and what he does when he's filming this is he always starts the slow motion at a point when the action is being accelerated. So when they're running in the Darjeeling Limited or they're walking down the steps in the Life Aquatic or they're leaving the graveyard in the Royal Tenenbaums. And here he starts to spin Miss Cross and they're dancing and that's the moment that he picks up that slow motion. And what I love about it, and I don't know if this is what he intended, but what I like is that it gives us this last chance to savor these moments and this world that he's allowed us to visit for the hour and a half for two hours that the film has been taking place. It's, it's almost like he gives us a chance to say goodbye because think about the best films you see. It's like almost disappointing when the credits start to roll because you're like, fuck, I didn't want that to be over. And that's how I feel in most uh, Wes Anderson films. And that's what he does here. And I don't know. It's that one last morsel. It makes you smile. It makes you appreciative. And it makes you keep coming back for more so that you can be in that world again. But Gene, you famously, you hate ensemble endings. You hate where everybody comes back together at the end for some final bow. And the after party, it works for me. I like that we get to see the happy ending, even though Max, he is not really likable. Everyone still is invested enough in this kid to come and show up for the play. And when Max is introducing his dad as a barber to everyone who he thought was a neurosurgeon, it kind of hit me and I was shocked at that. And this movie and this ending, it surprised me in a way. I could not believe this after party and everybody coming together. And as the, the they close the stage... I had a really good feeling that I did not predict. I thought you knew me better than that. I love ensemble endings. I don't like the ensemble ending at the end of Empire Records. <laughs> the rest <laughs> of them I love because Just that one <laughs> because I don't want people to be enemies and stuff. So at the end, I want everyone to get along. So no matter what role you played in the movie, I want everyone at the end to have some scene together where everything is just going, you know, just great. I actually. Often when I was a kid, I would think about, because I started out hating people very young. 
my idea of like heaven would be that once you die, you get to go to a place where like all the people in your life, whether you hated them or liked them, everyone's just getting along. That sounds pretty fucking cool to me, right? Like that's my mm-hmm. idea. So in that sense, uh, I do love an ensemble ending. And I did like when they were panning across the room, there were people who had no business being at that play. But it just felt nice to see everybody there. Like like Max brought all these people together. Like you said, like he touched all their lives in some way, whether it be completely ridiculous. I mean, fuck, he got fucking Magnus in the play. That makes no sense at all, but it feels good. Coach Beck is there. What's Coach <laughs> Beck doing there? <laughs> fucking Dr. Guggenheim came out of his stroke yes. and decided to show up for the play. <laughs> yes. Ash, you mentioned that Max is wonderful because of his confidence and because of his precociousness. And I do agree that I wish I'd been as assertive as Max when I was younger, especially like the way he goes after Luke Wilson at the restaurant. Yeah, that's ballsy. You know, he just tears into him because he's right. Luke Wilson was not invited. It is not a dinner where you just bring somebody with you. And there were so many times when I had a crush on somebody or had like, I wanted to get to know somebody a little better or impress them. And another dude showed up and I just fucking rolled with it. Even though under all like social norms, it was inappropriate for that guy to be there, but I just didn't want to be a dick. Max sticking up for himself. I mean, he's being kind of a prick about it, but he's a 15 year old who's had a couple of drinks. In every synopsis of this movie, every discussion I've had of this movie with anybody, and even in previous viewings, the consensus seems to be that Rosemary ends up with Bloom that they reconcile and they're dating. And I agree that she might date him. She might even marry him. But the feeling I get from this final scene is that Max has her heart, like whatever's left of her heart to give after all she's been through and who she is as a person. Maybe she can't really love in the way that we might think of like being fully loving someone, but I I don't see her having eyes for anyone other than Max. Yeah, I think she definitely falls for his spirit. I think that that is true. Zero sexual attraction, right? Like there's nothing sexual at all, I don't think, about the way she feels about Max. And I don't think that the movie would work as well if it were sexual in nature. But I think that she thinks he's incredible. I think she loves his humanity. She loves his heart. And she loves his spirit. And and who wouldn't? Because again, he's fucking cool. Uh, I, I think the key is that Max reminded her of her husband's spirit Mm -hmm. and he gave her the freedom to move on. You're sleeping here in your husband's room. What are you doing? His change was more about making her realize my husband's gone. Give people a chance. Give Max a chance. Give Bloom a chance. And for me, it's give Wes Anderson a chance. We should all take that opportunity. Well, and I, we haven't talked about it, but I mean, one of the darkest moments in this film is when he gets into her house and he realizes that she's sleeping in her dead husband's childhood yes. bedroom. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is such a sad scene, the way that that scene is set. And he looks at her and she talks about how her husband had more spirit in his fingernail than Bloom does. And he says, in one very dead fingernail. And while that's funny, like he... He really kind of slaps her in the face with that mm-hmm. truth of like, hey, like this is this is strange that you're still doing this. And again, what's fantastic about the whole thing, that non sequitur, is that he put his bike in the street to act like he got hit by a car, then climbed a ladder to her window. And she doesn't find that right. strange <laughs> at all. <laughs> well, now is the time we give our wipe scores for Rushmore. The wipe score is our way of telling you how many wipes this movie would take to get off your respective butts. Zero wipe is a perfect movie. It is writing a hit play. And five wipes is when your best friend tells kids at school that your mom gave him a hand job in the back of her car. Ash, we'll start with you. What is your wipe score for Rushmore? I mean, I think, spoiler alert from my review, I think this is an absolutely phenomenal film. I think every frame, every moment is fantastic. And I think that it is very difficult, though, to judge this movie and to look at it like kind of set apart from what Wes Anderson and this world he starts here to build would become. And I talked a lot about all of his films that I like from Royal Tenenbaums on. And let me just say, before the emails come in, I said that Moonrise Kingdom came out after Grand Budapest. It didn't. It came out two years before. So I apologize for misspeaking. Rachel. And I love them all except for Grand Budapest. And all of those movies, though, I think have a bit more emotional resonance than Rushmore does. I think that Wes Anderson hadn't gotten comfortable enough to be as vulnerable to show us his heart and to show us the heart of these worlds and the darkness of these worlds that he would create. But 
God, this movie is so good. And it made me laugh and it made me feel. And I think it's pretty close to perfect. And it makes me want to go and see the French Dispatch's new film like tomorrow just to get more Wes Anderson in my world. So I'm going to give it 0.5 wipes. My opinion on this movie is almost identical to yours. There's no surprise there. But I'm a little more critical. So same reasons, but I just think that those reasons hurt a little more. Rushmore is a fantastic movie that made me laugh out loud, which I don't often do. I did it several times. I also did that during the sure thing, but for different <laughs> reasons. Yeah, you were drunk. But I love the world. I loved the feeling. I love the aesthetic of Rushmore. And I even love the characters. But I agree that this is not Wes Anderson's best work. It isn't Life Aquatic. It isn't Royal Tenenbaums. Those movies were a little more vulnerable, a little more bleak, and frankly, a little more polished. I think that he really honed his craft a little bit more. That was the sweet spot, uh, the pinnacle of his career. And I don't think he was quite there yet, but still a fantastic movie. I'm going to go one wipe here. My hate of Wes Anderson. It's a good start. I don't know if it's a hate of myself. You know, I... <laughs> Uh, when I'm watching a movie, my question is, what am I expecting? Do I want to be surprised? I always think that he's pretentious, but maybe that's creativity. Maybe I'm just not enjoying the subject matter he always chooses, but I should respect his creativity. He's different. Just like Beck, who I mentioned before, his music, it might not be for everyone, but it is different and he doesn't care. And that genuine nature, that genuine technique could be something I think that could take you to a place you don't expect. I never expected to like this movie. I expected to hate it. The performances are good. The characters are all unique. Murray is a standout. He's quirky. It's fun. Overall, it's a charming movie. And it's charmed me enough that I'm going to give Wes Anderson a chance. And I don't think that I should judge movies as harshly as I do or directors as harshly as I do. So for me, I'm, I'm comfortable with the 1.25 wipe. I don't think it's groundbreaking, but it was enough to change my thinking on film. So you're saying that Red Dawn was a better made movie than Rushmore? Well, it's hard because as a kid, when you're impacted mm -hmm. by the Cold War and the, uh -huh. the, the, oh you know, the Russians coming over the border... <laughs> They impact you differently, but was it was it Red Dawn scripting, cinematography, <laughs> soundtrack, or uh, individual performances that put it uh, credit scene? Superior. Listen, listen, listen. We all have our problems. <laughs> you mean mistakes? No, Let's change that. No, we all no, have no, our no. mistakes. All of our mistakes. I can't change it. I love Red Dawn. I just it's it's like the Pavlovian dogs. You ring the bell, I'm going to salivate. I see the Russians <laughs> coming in with the parachutes, <laughs> and I'm afraid. I run to the hills. I go with Jed up there. I'm going to go. And, uh, I can't help it. But this movie, it was a pleasant change, and I'm going to give movies a chance. And I'm going to give Wes Anderson a chance. Big D, somewhere out there, there's a kid, a young Big D out there <laughs> googling Pavlovian. <laughs> yes. Oh. That was yes. a non sequitur. Yes. All right. So with half a wipe from Ash, one wipe from me, and 1.25 wipes from Big D, Dick Ebert, we come out to an average wipe score of 0 0.916 repeating wipes for Rushmore. We good on the math? You sure on that? I'm going to double check here. Check it so, just because we've never had a movie <laughs> score of 0.91. All right. So 0 0.5 plus... One is 1.5 yes. <laughs> plus 1.25 uh -huh. is 2.75 divided by three is 0 0.916 repeating. Final oh. answer. Okay, I like it. So with a 0 0.91 wipe score, that now puts this in the 34 spot. It is slightly better. I feel dirty saying this. The Empire Strikes Back, Conan the Barbarian, Rounders, and the Terminator slightly worse then The Hunt for Red October, Clueless, E.T., and Beetlejuice. Okay, who dragged the Terminator score now? Is it me? Oh, no, that was that was Cole Pickock. That oh, was Cole Pickock, who had never seen it before. Who dragged Empire down? I think I dragged the uh, Empire Strikes Back with my 1.5 wipes. Yeah, it was 1.5 from me, half a wipe from you, and uh, one wipe from Roger. Yeah. I, I stand by my one and a half wife's for Empire Strikes Back. It's mm -hmm. a good movie. It's not a great movie. I think it's a one. I love that movie. Definitely not 0. 0.5, though. Well, I'm, I'm confident with this being around a one wipe. I think that's, uh, yeah, it's about right. Me too. Yeah. Feels good. Me three. Well, we hope you're satisfied with that wipe score, Paul. 
Uh, moving on, we've got a letter in this week uh, from Brandon in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Hello, Shat Crew. My name is Brandon, and I have been listening only for a couple of years. I randomly found the podcast and immediately made my way through the back catalog, and in my opinion, the show has steadily improved over time. I am emailing you because I wanted to tell you two things as briefly as I am able to. First, I have consistently loved the show, but I noticed when listening to older episodes, my enjoyment ebbed and flowed depending on whether or not one person was hosting or not. My intention is not to shit on that person completely because they may be a very entertaining and lovely person. They just simply did not hit for me. In my opinion, adding Ashley as a permanent host has greatly increased the show, not just because she is female, though that is certainly helpful, but because she brings a unique perspective and experience just as Jean and Big D do, making her a perfect complement to the group. Secondly, and more importantly, your time period for these movie selections is especially important to me. In 1993, my dad was killed in a car accident. At the time, I was nine and obviously had no clue how to handle each day without a father, and neither did my mom. What we found out helped was distractions, specifically movies. My mother got as many movie channels as she could afford and daily brought home VHSs from the video store near where she worked. For the next couple of years, I would look forward to any movie, good or bad, as long as they allowed me to disappear into them and forget my sadness for a couple of hours. Many of these films you have covered on the show and many of them likely not appropriate for a child, though I would argue I am more normal than many people I meet who weren't allowed to watch R-rated movies. I say that all to say your show has also helped me and likely many others to disappear mentally, to forget about stress and fears and pain, allowing me to just laugh for an hour or so. Even when you say incorrect things like The Sandlot is not the best (laughs) kids movie of all time. So thank you so much for all the time and work you three put into the show. It matters. P.S. I am unfortunately too impatient to submit a commission and then wait a year to hear your opinions, though I wouldn't be upset if the 80s BMX classic Rad ends up being discussed. Brandon from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Is that is that something you guys do or do kids like still watch movies with their parents? I mean, I was just with Fen just a couple of days ago going to see Venom. I mean, Fen and I try to go see a movie about every second weekend we go together. And Ellie comes sometimes. But yeah, I mean, in most weekends, we pick mm-hmm. a movie that we watch together as a family. And every Mother's Day, our tradition is that I show them a movie from my childhood and we all watch it together. So we're definitely raising some movie lovers. Yeah, on Saturday, we had a family movie night. Which Emma is, I can't tell if she's excited about the movie or the fact that we're going to have popcorn and candy, but we watched Adam's Family, the second one. It's the brand new, the animated film. And we watch as a family, we put the phones down and it's a great time, like just to see Emma laugh or to just sit down and not be distracted for that hour and a half. It's something I don't think we do today. And it, it was a fun Saturday night for us. When it's like that time where you get to teach your kids like the, you know, right tricks, like how to mix M&Ms with your popcorn correctly oh, or, that's, that's you know, how to, you know, balance out the sour candy and the sweet candy. So you got to make sure you get the milk duds and the sour patch kids. Otherwise, you're just unsatisfied halfway through the film. Right. Like these are life lessons that you got to pass on to them. <laughs> I think it's really important too to like impart knowledge and values into them as well. So like when you're watching something like The Sandlot, you can say, listen, it's inappropriate oh to act like God. you're drowning. To make a girl kiss you because that would be sexual assault. The Sandlot is amazing. Thank you so much, our our writer here, because the Sandlot is incredible and Gene is wrong. So listen, to this one of Vanessa's biggest fears in life, because Emma came out looking very, very Aryan like me. So <laughs> Vanessa's biggest fear is that somehow the fertility clinic we went to fucked up. And that the egg was not hers. There's no doubt Emma's mine. But the question of <laughs> Vanessa, she secretly harbors this fear that Emma is not hers. So Adam's Family Part 2 is all about Wednesday, whether or not the Adams are her family. And someone makes a claim on her and comes out and tries to take Wednesday. So the whole time, Emma's like, well, what's going on? Why is that man there talking about when the babies were born? I'm looking at Vanessa like, oh. That's her fear. And great conversation and great fun on Saturday. Now I'm just left wondering, like, because I do this to myself in my own head, is would I rather have a kid who is brilliant, athletic, 
very, very talented, very successful in life, very fun to be around, charming, and then later find out that it's actually not my kid genetically, that there was a mix-up, or would I rather have it be genetically my kid, but an absolute fuck-up? Either way, they would be your kid because yeah. you you were mm-hmm. their dad. Okay, so I'm going for the winner. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but but uh, quick side review. Emma laughed multiple times in Adam's family. It was, it was entertaining, but... Yeah, we went to go see Venom because we're not really a cartoon household. Venom was awful. Yeah, she'll have nightmares. But next week, hopefully this movie will not give people nightmares. We are going to tell the tale of Gib, a college freshman who keeps striking out with women when he learns that a beautiful Californian wants to have a tryst with him. He decides to carpool all the way to the West Coast and meet her. Unfortunately, one of the other passengers on the trip is Allison, an attractive but domineering girl who has rejected Gibbs once before. The journey is a nightmare until the funny things happen. Gibbs and Allison start to fall in love. And this was commissioned by Haley S. It was released in 1995, directed by Rob Reiner. And uh, Gene and I watched this basically in a drive-in theater online on Friday. Uh, you know, it took us like two and a half hours to watch an hour and a half movie yeah. because I kept running back and forth with my, uh, basically guys, we, we did some illegal shit. <laughs> we got the job done. Thank you everyone for who joined us for that screening. And, uh, we'll never do that again. I disagree. I think we should do it often. Well, thank you, Haley, for, uh, commissioning the upcoming movie. And thank you, Paul, for commissioning Rushmore. That is concludes this week's episode of shat the movies be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend we're on facebook twitter snapchat and instagram at shat the movies you can email us host at shat the or call and leave a voicemail 914-719-SHAT you can support the podcast by shopping our amazon affiliate link completing a free anonymous survey to help attract advertisers buying our merch or commissioning your own movie find all that information by visiting our website shat the also check out our sister podcast shat on tv we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all that information on our website, ShadowTV.com, where everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, and if you stop by iTunes, please leave a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-host, Big D and Ash, I'm Gene Lyons. Join us next week for the following movie. Gibson! What? Don't you have an 8 o'clock? What time is it? 9 to 8. Ah! Uh, Lights out! Walter Gibb Gibson lives life on the edge. What do you think of that guy, Gibb? I don't. Forget it, Gibson. I hear she likes the intellectual type. It's all in intellectual and stuff. You're flanking English. That's your mother tongue and stuff. Allison Bradbury favors a more orderly existence. 7 o'clock news, 7.30 shower, 7.45 phone call. 8 o'clock? 8 o'clock, I don't know. That's when I rearrange my sock drawer. They have very little in common. How would you like to have a sexual encounter so intense it could conceivably change your political views? Except that each has someone waiting in California. 